Welcome back to another episode of the Better Learning Podcast. I'm excited to bring in our guest today. Uh, he is coming with a perspective that's coming more from like the libraries and children's services. And he's a director of children's library services in Des Moines, Iowa, Dr. Zachary Steer. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I, I think you, uh, we always try to have a different representation of all aspects of education, typically when we're looking at kind of like the K-12 environment. I guess, give me a little bit of your background of kind of how you got involved in education, where your passions are. And I'm sure I'm going to interrupt you like 20 times as you're <laughs> as you're, you're giving some of that. Yeah. So I always like to tell folks that I, I come from an informal learning uh, path. So that's why I'm in public libraries. I've been in public libraries since I was 15, I believe. Um, and started in 2011 in my current position. So my connection really with educators in more formal learning environments happens on, you know, in my job daily through our outreach programming, through our partnerships. So I get to work with educators from all the way from preschool, all the way, let's say high school, even college. So very cool. So what's interesting is most of the time, like our guests are talking more of like they're in the schools. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm always trying to like bring in different aspects to make sure that we're not kind of getting stuck in our silos coming from more like the libraries. What mm -hmm. what's kind of your view? Like when you're looking at and I'm going to start in particular with spaces because there's there's a decent amount of our audience that's really looking at designing or renovating mm -hmm. educational spaces. What's the lens that you you put that through when people are coming in to your library? Yeah, so I always um, envision our library, you know, we have a physical library, right? So it's a brick and mortar building where we uh, invite, you know, our citizens as well as those who are interested in learning more about our community library into the space. Um, but making sure that the space is inviting uh, for all walks of life, um, different learning stages, developmental play is a pretty big thing for us too. Um, we're not a quiet library, um, and I don't think libraries now uh, where we're sitting, um, it's more of a community gathering space for everyone to connect. And as far as, you know, those who are not in the library, um, I always like to say that we, we work really hard to mobilize our services too, to ensure that the library can be in multiple locations. So bringing the library to them and having conversations of what that looks like, whether it be providing resources or programs and helping them to evolve the space so that there's that connection too. I like how you answered that to be starting out of even like our we're brick like there's an aspect of brick and mortar of like your physical space, but it, it lends me to think that when you're having your conversations about what is a library, it's not mm -hmm. just about the building. Yeah, we want to uh, treasure libraries; they've been around forever, and um, you know our library is on the National Historic Registry. We're not a, a Carnegie Library per se, uh, but it is a, a treasure. Libraries are a treasure to the community. And we uphold a civic responsibility to be a place for all, but we also want to ensure that if we can't be a place where those can come to, there's multiple reasons why, um, that we can bring uh, the library to them in whatever capacity that can be as much as possible. Tell me a little bit more your kind of your personal journey. What at what point did you did you think I am gonna work in a library? Yeah, that's such a great question. So I have been, I'm a reader, I mean, obviously, uh, but my dad, I will say, uh, was really grounded me in ensuring that we would need to visit libraries, we need to, uh, you know, check out books and spend that uh, quality time in our community. So from the get go early on, I just knew the library was a place for me. It was a place where I could discover myself, a place where there are characters and settings like me, but also where I can learn more about the world. So after, you know, childhood, uh, my journey educationally, I have a learning disability. So I've had to and continue to fight really hard to ensure that I have that space to grow and to learn. And what libraries have been able to help me with is using narrative skills, skills like I am now. Storytelling is a big thing for me. So 
I just knew I needed to find that niche, which is libraries and being a public librarian. And then in discovering children's services, how exciting it is every day that I get to do all sorts of fun stuff with kids, um, whether it be puppet shows or going out and reading to them and bringing new opportunities like space and science. So that's a little bit about my journey educationally. You know, I have a doctorate, obviously, in education. My research focuses strongly on family engagement, ecological systems, informal learning environments. So that's where I'm at today. Well, what what's like the current issue or the things that either like are keeping you up at night or kind of the the opportunities that you're looking at of like, man, what what, what are those problems that you're thinking about? Yeah. So um I take my job very seriously. I don't really look at it as a career, right? It's such a passion for me to do. I'm very privileged and honored to do what I do. But, you know, there's a couple things. As we all know right now, this this topic of banned books, um, I alluded to this in my response regarding my journey. Um, for me, libraries and collection of books offer an opportunity to connect to understand who I am, understand the world. Um, but it keeps me up at night to think that um, folks want to, you know, ban. I, I want to stress that it's important for anyone to um, raise the question as to why something is in a collection. That is important. Uh, but for public libraries especially, as I said, it's a civic responsibility that we are a place for everyone from all walks of life. Um, but besides more of that, you know, more mainstream concern, and I would say it's also a concern in my state, um, I would say, too, to ensure that libraries continue to get funded. Uh, we are a gem to the community, um, offering a third place for folks to gather and f to connect. So I would say funding is always something that we want to ensure is, is happening. Um, so, yeah. There's a lot in there. I'm going to pull in a few different things so but so you're in boone iowa how like where mm -hmm. like how uh, would you consider is it rural like how close like where where yeah. are you kind of in relationship to des moines and sure so we're 40 miles roughly to des moines which is the capital of iowa 20 miles from ames iowa and i say that because ames uh, houses iowa state university which is a very one of the third largest um universities in in the state um and we consider ourselves to be a small, medium-sized community. It's a little about 12,000, a little above that um, in, in our town. And um, our library would be classified as a small system library. I would say small, medium-sized library too um, in, in that regard. So, and we are very active. We have a lot of Act, you know programs and a lot of citizen and community support yeah so it's a lot of the same conversation i feel like we're having in schools of like those communities mm -hmm. and creating community spaces mm -hmm. How, so i'm curious i mean in a town like that um like is there interaction with the school districts and yeah this is this this question excites me because uh i consider my myself and, and all of us at the library quite lucky to, to have uh, a leadership in uh, um, ensuring that partnerships are happening and that freedom to uh, allow for those partnerships and discovering those. And one of them is the schools. We are very active with the schools and vice versa. Schools are reaching out to us and we're reaching out to them. And I will um, give credit where credit's due. I mean, I've been there 12 years, but it's been something that's been built even before me. And I feel that it's getting much stronger. There's a strong bridge there. And so um, we invite them to our events. They come to, we go to their events. Um, uh, educators are using our resources. So um, I have vowed as much as possible to be in the schools, whether it be public or parochial, um, every month. And so sometimes that's like seven to eight visits, which can be a lot, but I want to ensure that we're as visible as possible. And that's why I love informal learning environments, because then, you know, the kiddos that we reach will come out to the community and visit the library and say, oh, 
now there's Mr. Z, you know, he's been to my class. It's exciting. Now I'm, I'm now at the library. And so it brings also new families and new faces. So. So I don't have a whole extensive knowledge on like the library systems and how they work and even like how how it's like in other countries. So I I am kind of curious to hear of like what, like, I think it's one of the coolest kind of components to this country is that like the commitments to say that we, uh, we, we recognize that the libraries and books and the access to this type of knowledge should be available for everyone for free. Mm -hmm. Is that uniquely American? That's a really great question. And you bring up a good point. Um, I have just, you know, connected with somebody um, from another country and I've been trying to learn more about, um, their system, you know, of government. I think it does depend on, how, you know, the governmental system, whether it be democracy, socialism, communism. Um, I would take that in great a great factor. I will be honest; I have not done enough research on the different systems, the different countries. But what is something incredibly important, and I want to touch on what you said is free access, and that needs to remain and will remain um, in, in a, as part of our country, right? As I said, there is a, a civic responsibility that we uphold to ensure that there's freedom of access for, for everyone um, from all walks of life. So I would say, you know, I need to do maybe a little bit more research. No, that's that's all right. I didn't, expect, I, but, I didn't expect you to be the expert sure. on that, but I, no, that's okay. it's one of those, one of those things that I'm like, man, it's like, uh, like it, when you do start looking at that mission of it, of like that free access, and then you start looking at you know, like the technology impact sure. and even kind of this conversation of it, and, it is more yeah. than just the brick and mortar building. Exactly. And and I'll say this, you know, in other parts of the world, like we let's consider ourselves lucky that we have access. I will say there is limited access, whether that be because of how the, you know, that country is ran, you know, whatever system, but also um, if they have the resources to have a brick and mortar, you know, some, a library doesn't have to be this gigantic building. And that's why we look at little free libraries or we, we look at libraries in smaller communities who, you know, put up a tent or whatever it might be. Um, So I think, you know, there's some adaptability too with even that brick and mortar yeah is it a constant funding battle like do you feel like you're you're set up for success there or is it something that you're always like that's that's always part of the conversation sure it's a great question so i am going to speak on my community and then i'll speak a little bit about outside Um, i consider our community and how we are funded as a library supportive and i attribute that to our amazing library director and our library board who in our community for that matter who advocate strongly the city funds us and provides adequate funding we have funding coming from the state so you know there's been some dips in that ups and downs as they it just happens, but as of right now, we're we're sitting pretty well. I think it just depends on the community. It depends on the state and how they value and see public libraries. Um, that I can tell you with my connection to somebody in another democratic country. Um, they their government doesn't necessarily value public library as a system, so they have limited funding going to the public library. Um, I believe at the federal level, we have the Institute for Museum and Libraries who do an amazing job um, uh, to ensure that there is, you know, uh, attention to our politicians, that there's funding at the federal level because they provide a multitude of grants. Um, So, and the American Library Association does an amazing job with that advocacy and making sure that libraries are equipped to advocate for their library to ensure as much as possible that there's funding, uh, you know, uh, going to them. Yeah. I I definitely want to hear more about um, kind of, you you mentioned that of like just more the experiential and like how it's can be loud and learning. And it it reminds me of a teacher that I talked to several years ago and she was all like, learning is loud. (laughs) Like so many times people think like it's this like quiet and like individual or like, you know, a teacher lecturing type of thing. Can you describe a little bit more of like what, what that looks like when you, when you say that phrase? 
Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. So I um, want to ensure that we are, we are focused on the child and their development. And um, it does us no good to create a restricted environment where they can't do what they're supposed to do, which is to explore, which is to play, which is to communicate. Now in a public library, then we have the families helping them to connect. So on a weekly basis, I'll give you an example in the last two weeks. You know, we've had a cultural cooking program. We had a, a gentleman come and, and teach just how to make tortillas correctly um, and brought in a multitude of families. Um, Mo Willems, who's popular for the, the Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus series. We, we had the pigeon come. We reached 500 uh, children in schools as well as at the public library through that program. Um, and our programs are multi-sensory approach, uh, project-based learning sometimes, and giving uh, children as well as youth ample time to help direct those programs too. So I can't recall, unless you come to one of our meditation and yoga programs, a very quiet program. We're not just, we're not screaming necessarily, but we're very active. We want to ensure that we're as active and connecting as possible to also help parents who may not have had that experience in a public library to be like, wow, you know, this is great. I want to return to this. So definitely a return of investment is pretty important to us too. How, when you talk about return of inve on investment, what, what is that ROI? Like, what are you tracking? Yeah. And that, that's, a, that's a tough one. It's a, it's a tough one, you know, and, and when we do some pilot programs and sometimes those programs are directed at, let's say educators who have, you know, a definite audience of, of students to track and families to track. It's hard because we don't necessarily have always the same families, but we track the experience that we hear. Definitely that experience of this touched my life in some way. I had fun today. I definitely want to come back. You know, we have a collection statistics, making sure that our items are being circulated. That's pretty strong. Uh, we track how many you know library users we have, internet usage, um, programmatic statistics, but um, qualitative and quantitative have a blend. And I'm all about data storytelling, um, which is something incredibly important is how we allow the patron experience to help enhance our services and resources even further. And to ensure that their voices help um, create the story of the library and its impact. Yeah. And I think just for our audience to kind of take this conversation, I, I think the big thing that is we talk a lot about whether it's designers or school leaders that are building or renovating new spaces or, or dealing with, with those challenges. Um, we're always having these discussions of bringing in the community. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a perfect, alliance in a way uh, of being able to say just hearing you talk are a lot of the same aspects that we're looking at in the education mm -hmm. however i would say one of the trends we're seeing a lot in the schools is is almost like the removal of the libraries or going more to the mm -hmm. media centers or trying to make those spaces um kind of more accessible um throughout the day instead of just having it as like almost like just one area in the the library and mm -hmm. I, I yeah I, I think it, it's a uh, conversation that I don't know how many communities are having I've seen it in some but I don't know how much it's going sure. across um, because it, it just seems like there's a natural alliance there yeah absolutely and I'll, I'll you know I don't have career experience working in a public or excuse me a school library but I do partner with school libraries and they are amazing human beings they do so much to support their schools as much as they can and here in in my community um it's not 
only focused on literacy. Now we have the STEAM connection there too. And using the, the library as a space to learn, not only through books, but through other things like technology and, and STEAM activities and the like. Uh, but you are correct. It is similar. I always tell, I teach uh, part-time as an adjunct lecturer at the University of Illinois uh, I school, And I always tell my students that we can and should be at the table, um, that we have a voice and um, it's important to listen and to add, but we can add value to the conversation. So I try my best to find places where we can be at the table to provide another lens from a community perspective, from an informal learning perspective that can help elevate the conversation but we also rely on the others around the table to support the library and help us too. Yeah. And I know you're, you're working on a book, right? Working on a book. I'm co-authoring a book on creativity um, with Tom Rendon. Uh, Tom is, um, has a strong background in early childhood and my background is a public library. And we came together um, three years ago <laughs> can't believe it's been three years to really discuss the topic of creativity, the, a passion project um, for us. Creativity, as we have, you know, been discovering through research and interviews and case studies, um, really needs to be nurtured more and understood more from a multitude of levels. And so hopefully with our book, um, our future readers will grasp that. Um, readers can be from early childhood educators, administrators, uh, but also parents and public librarians. So we wanted to add that value to somebody with the experience of more of a formal learning setting and somebody with a more informal learning setting and see where things that we can come out of that. Yeah. Cool. Oh, so who, who would be the intended audience for the book? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think what we treasure with this is, um, an early childhood educator could pick up the book, but then a parent could pick up the book or a public librarian could pick up the book. And so they, they'll be able to pick up aspects. We didn't just want to regurgitate things. We wanted to analyze it, synthesize it, but also to provide ample opportunity to ask questions. So there's some inquiry-based learning for them to reflect uh, whatever learning environment that they're reflecting on. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up with kind of two opposite sure. questions here. Um, yeah. And then I'll, I'll give you a chance to, if there's anything I didn't ask you about. But, yeah. um, you know, times are changing really quick. Like, I feel like that's mm -hmm. like, like, I, it, it just, I have the sense of talking to a lot of people that just like, we're on the verge of like, it, we may look back and be like, oh, it already changed and we just haven't recognized it. But I feel like we're on the verge of something that is just, big changes that are happening. If we were going to look out 10, 20 years and the libraries are gone, mm -hmm. what would be your reason why? Like, like why, why would they disappear? Well, that is a gross room. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will say, I'll start off by saying it would not be because of the advocacy and um uh, from our patrons, from those in the profession. It would be because those more in that leadership, legislative, whatever realm who um, would provide that funding and support have uh, decided that the value is, is no longer, um, which is a very grim belief, but it would, it would be something I hope wouldn't happen um, but it, cause I really believe if, if public libraries were to go away, communities would fail. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. And, and I don't mean to go that way, but I, yeah. but I, but I, I, I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of just like kind of established, um, pieces of our, of our society that, um, <laughs> I, I think we've maybe just taken for granted that things will always be there. And I think it's a question that um, we've had on the schools too, of like, sure. what, what changes? Like what, like if the, um, you know, the whole experiment of like 
of free education right. fails, what what would be the reason why? So I'm, I'm going to end it with a little more positive here. It's great. <laughs> Let's go 10, 20 years. And now we say like the vast majority of the community members are utilizing the libraries as intended. Mm-hmm. Yay. What, what did that look like? Why do you think that happens? Or what are those things that would need to happen to, sure. to continue or, you know, to, to, make that thrive within the communities yeah well if that if i i believe that will libraries will be here 100 percent believe that and it would be because of a continued support um that focus on the funding that focus that we do have a return of investment not only specific to the library but to the community in itself and it would just um ensure that there's adequate additional adequate resources and programs and services available to the community. So uh, yes, I truly believe we will continue to be around for that, those reasons. What else did I, uh, anything else that you wanted to share that I didn't ask you about? I know I could yeah. uh, <laughs> a variety of topics in there. Yeah. Um, the la- I just want to, I always like to end you know, being in this profession since I was 15, and I do count those years, I'm incredibly honored to be in this profession. This profession is filled 100% with advocates who are fighting the good fight, who are providing amazing services and support to their community. Public libraries are, we're not enemy. (laughs) We are here to support and to lift up a community and to really highlight the importance of what value our communities have. And so we just really need to continue to work together for the common good for everybody. Yeah. So those are my, my final words. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. I appreciate the work you're doing. I was just telling someone last week of this, like how, when I lived in Columbus, Ohio, I was, hit, I was like hit all the libraries, like all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and use yeah. it is just such a great community space. Like just one of those, just, yeah. Like treasures that I feel like, that are there. Um, and yeah, and I just, am always looking at like, what's that evolution that supports the mission, um, you know, as things can sometimes feel like they're rapidly changing around us. And I, okay. I thought I had final, but I'll fin- finish it with this. <laughs> That's something you bring up, continue to advocate uh, to everybody, whether it be in your community, whether it be to your city officials, to your legislators at the federal, wherever, you're doing continue to be at that table and to advocate strongly we we need as many voices as possible because we are in a very unique situation but not something necessarily new but the increase in let's say banned uh books has grown exponentially so we just need continued advocates and supporters to help us awesome well, Zachary, I great. appreciate your time. Yeah, great talking to you. But, yeah, thank you. And to the listeners, just make sure you hit subscribe wherever you're at. Um, this will be coming out roughly about the time of LearningScape. So um, if it's past that, I hope, you, I hope you're able to make and enjoy the event. We are recording live at LearningScapes in Chicago. So if you do hear this beforehand, um, make sure that you stop by. We want to make sure we're getting a lot of different perspectives from the people that are in, in the LearningScapes A4LE community. Um, and uh, yeah, just really appreciate uh, the support and the ideas. So if you go to betterlearningpodcast.com, that is kind of the hub. So um, fill out information. We are trying to make sure that we're aligning people who either um, have ideas for the show, but also kind of take away things of like, how do we actually further kind of the mission here of improving education? There's some different uh, avenues you can take based on uh, the survey that's on there. So appreciate it, Zachary. Great meeting you. Yes. Thank you. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.